it's a, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce this session on the management of limited metastases. And you know, one thing we had a great group of people that worked on putting this program together, including H.J. and Joel Tepper and uh, Deb Mayer and others, to to kind of do this program a little differently. And we thought this was a more exciting way to look at things than just do breast, lung, colon like we're used to. So, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Kim and his colleagues are going to talk about some exciting case in the management of limited metastases. Uh, Dr. Kim is associate professor at surgery here. He is an outstanding GI surgeon, um, and he is perfect to lead, moderate, and keep our outstanding discussions on time. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome back from the break. Um, this session will be a little bit different in that it'll involve an entire panel of, of speakers. And each one of the, the, the panel speakers will introduce not only their modality, but we'll also have three case discussions as in a simulated uh, tumor board discussion. Um, the great thing about this panel is that each one of them has specific expertise in their field, and I'll introduce them in a second. The hard thing about this panel is that we all tend to be a little bit long-winded, so it'll be a little bit of a challenge to keep everybody on time. So starting from that end, it's Matt Morrow, who's professor and chair of uh, radiology and who leads our interventional radiology group. That's uh, Matt Ewan, who's professor and chair of neurosurgery. Ben Haithcock, who's an associate professor in the division of cardiothoracic surgery. Joel Tepper, who's a Hector McLean professor uh, of radiation oncology, and myself in surgical oncology. And so we'll might as well move straight into the uh, presentation. Um, I first wanted to start by introducing this whole idea of oligometastasis or limited metastasis because I think that this is a, a new entity and this is a, an entity, um, relatively new entity, and it's an entity that really does involve local modalities even in the face of metastatic disease. It's defined as being distant re relapse in only a limited uh, number of regions, and it was a real paradigm shift when it was introduced in 1995 by uh, Dr. Hellman and Wechselbaum in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. We know that there are some features of clinical importance in this, in this uh, clinical entity called oligometastasis. We know that histology and the sites of metastasis does matter. We know that the interval of disease matters. And we also know that the response to systemic therapy, at least non-progression in response to, uh, to systemic therapy also matters because we want to be convinced that the patient is free of occult microscopic disease. What it has done is really changed our approach with local modalities, even in the face of uh, stage four disease. The original paper in 1995 was followed by a second paper in 2011, also by the same authors, where they really talk about this restricted tumor metastatic capacity. And what it really implies is that local cancer treatments are curative in a proportion of these patients. We really don't exactly know what the prevalence of this clinical entity is, other than the fact that it is going to be a probably a rising clinical importance because we're getting better with imaging, as we talked about in the previous session, as well as, uh, as, as, well as uh, vast improvements that we made with cl uh, clinical serum markers. We know that there is evidence em emerging in these fields, and um, some of the prime examples of, of areas where we know some of the evidence is in liver metastases from colorectal cancers, lung metastases from several primaries, such as sarcomas and colon cancers, and adrenal metastases from lung cancers. As you can see in this panel, there are no medical oncologists, and it's somewhat by design. Uh, one, because medical oncologists tend to be even more long-winded than we are. <laughs> and uh, we also didn't want to be clouded by evidence. So, uh, <laughs> So we will go on with the rest of our uh, presentations. Um, I think the best evidence um, is really with surgical resection. It's where we have the longest evidence. Um, we have made significant uh, improvements in not only outcomes, but we have decreased complications, even with some of these very extensive operations. And that's in largely in part due to either technological advances with our surgical, uh, surgical instruments, perioperative care with both anesthetic and ICU care, and also with minimally invasive techniques, some of which Dr. Hithcock will talk about um, later on in the, in the session. Um, we've also uh, seen uh, increased importance of stereotactic radiotherapy and ablative technologies, as, as well as image-guided delivery of chemotherapy and radiospheres. So we're going to start first with Joel Tepper and um, looking at stereotactic body radiation therapy and surgery. 
Well, th thanks, H.J. Be because uh, some radiosurgical approaches are used in basically a variety of, of anatomical sites, uh, we're going to go through give a general overview of some of the information. I personally do don't uh, haven't done any lung radiation surgery, but I've spent a lot of time on liver and have done some lung. You know, the, the basic goal of radiation therapy is to deliver as high a dose as possible to the tumor, minimize dose to the normal organs, thus to minimize side effects. And for decades, the purpose radiation therapists have tried to improve this and thereby improve the therapeutic ratio. And traditional radiation therapy delivers a small dose of radiation each day. For the curative therapy, it's often six to eight weeks of treatment. And this is effective in many disease sites. It has a long track record for many cancers. And therefore, it needs to be a standard from which we compare other approaches. But in comparison, stereotactic radiation, be it called radiation therapy in multiple fractions or radiosurgical in a single fraction, uses an extremely accurate small field radiation therapy to really dis ablate a tumor and probably acts somewhat biologically different than standard radiation therapy. But it's really an ablative, ablative approach. At UNC, we use a machine, which is a cyber knife, so we'll refer to that a lot. But again, the purpose is a very small field, treat the tumor very precisely, not surrounding structures, minimize normal tissue uh, dose and therefore injury. And because of the ways in which we use this, it's usually for relatively small tumors. And oligometastatic disease fits that mold uh, fairly well. The procedure itself is non-invasive, although sometimes we have the interventional radiologists need to put markers in to help localize tumors, and typically over one to five treatments. So the CyberKnife radiosurgery system that we have at UNC is a linear accelerator that's basically mounted on a robotic head that can follow, go over multiple paths, uh, and each one of these a beam coming in focused on an area in the brain such that any entrance area gets very low dose, but everything else converges right on the tumor uh, to be able to deliver a very high dose to this localized tumor mass. Um, this was supposed to be a, uh, if I have the right one, a, a, a movie which doesn't work but because uh, <laughs> I just looked. Um, but basically, this machine will move around from one place to another. There are imaging devices so that the patient can be monitored uh, during therapy, and you can set the interval. It can be every 15 seconds or every 10 seconds. So an image is generated to be sure that everything is uh, the correct way. Uh, you can change the, uh, this machine will move following respiration, and so you can really track very precisely with basically a couple of millimeter accuracy in terms of one wants to treat, and for some areas such as the brain, it's probably uh, less than, a f it's less than that, it's probably down on a millimeter or so accuracy. When you track breathing motion, we actually build a model between some uh, light emitting diode, uh, diodes that are on the patient so you can monitor respiration from a, a basically a vest that is tracked and we develop a picture of the, where the tumor is with respect to that and therefore this allows tracking uh, in real time as we go through and it again allows for the precision of the delivery. So I want to go very briefly with an overview of the three major areas that we will be talking about in the session today and first talk a little bit about liver. Uh, the radiation therapy has been used relatively little for, radiation, uh, for liver tumors in the past, largely because of the limited tolerance of normal liver to radiation therapy, and so it wasn't very used. The tolerance of the liver depends very heavily on the normal tissue tolerance of the liver. The liver is a sensitive structure, but radiosurgery allows us to use a more ablative approach and spare much of the normal liver. It is easier to deliver this radiosurgery for uh, peripheral lesions rather than central lesions. It's easier to treat smaller lesions rather than larger lesions. But in reality, is the way we do it here, because we have uh, surgeons and interventional radiologists who can treat the small peripheral lesions really, really well, we don't treat those. We treat, tend to treat the central lesions that are harder to treat with um, um, with RFA, microwave ablation approaches, or with surgical resection. We actually have a protocol that is open at the present time 
to evaluate treatment of these tumors. Much of the data in the literature is based on the treatment of peripheral lesions, where one can get very good control. And there's not much data on the tolerance of the central bile ducts to high-dose radiation, and it's something that you actually might be afraid where you could cause problems. And lastly, we are also entering patients with poor liver function, and these have also not been generally studied in the radiosurgical literature to date. So it's a dose escalation study. We're treating patients both with hepatocellular carcinoma and oligometastatic disease, as defined here, looking at toxicity and local control. And it's generally for across the board with these approaches in the liver. We're treating patients who are not good resections for resection, RFA, and in the case of um, HCC for transplant. So we're not the first option in most situations, but we are an option that adds to our armamentarium of treating oligometastatic disease. And you have to define what the normal liver can tolerate fairly well, and we have some parameters that we use, how much, uh, what dose is delivered to, uh, I mean, what volume of the liver gets a certain dose, which is numbered here. So we want to have at least 700 cc's received less than 15 gray of radiation. We're cognizant of tolerance of esophagus, heart, stomach, and bowel that can be nearby, as well as other organs that are really important to this <coughs> issue. And this is just a slide showing a radiation dose distribution. The tumor is here in a central area hard to treat. There's a very high dose area that, that, that is treated here. But the peripheral lesion, uh, the peripheral liver gets relatively low dose, so allow this treatment to be tolerated. Brief comments on lung metastases, and I don't claim to be an expert on lung metastases, but basically a lobectomy or wedge resection is very standard for patients with oligometastatic disease. Uh, and I would add, somewhat disagreeing with what H.J. said earlier, uh, even though uh, Sam Hellman and Ralph Wechselbaum are, are close friends of mine, uh, they did not invent the, the idea of treating oligometastatic disease. Uh, when I was at the NCI in 1980, we were treating a large number of patients with sarcomas with resection of oligometastatic disease in the lung. And also, there are a lot of data in terms of long, long-term follow-up and curative, curative treatment in treatment of oligometastatic disease. So many patients have comorbidities. They have COPD. They may not be candidates for resection. And radiosurgery is a possibility for treating generally, again, generally the patients who are not ideally treated for one reason or another by another approach. Here's an example of a peripheral lesion that uh, could, could be treated with CyberKnife. Um, sometimes it's an issue of preference in terms of, of what you do. We tend not to treat in the more central areas. We're more concerned about uh, toxicity when, when it was real central. People have argued whether this is true, but right now we're at least more cautious about treatment in those areas. And here's an example of a, of a pretreatment lesion, a relatively large lesion, and three months post-treatment showing uh, really good, some good responses. And if you look not at oligometastatic disease, but you look at lung cancer, one sees that after a variety of stereotactic approaches from a variety of institutions, one can at least get control in the primary site in the range of 80 to 90 percent. So we do have some fairly good data saying that this approach certainly can be effective in controlling the local disease. Uh, lastly, brain metastases. You'll again hear much more about this uh, when uh, Dr. Ewan uh, speaks. It is an alternative to surgery in, uh, in a few situations, but it is, can be quite effective in treating oligometastatic disease, again, because of treating a small volume of brain. There's one study from Boston on 248 patients with 421 brain metastases, radiosurgical treatments, with 85 percent local control rate at, at one year. So at, at one year, one is producing pretty good results in terms of uh, local control, and this can be symptomatically very important. There's also treatment of, with radiation surgery, radiation therapy, or radiosurgical approach after surgery. This is something that is still being uh, evaluated. We know that patients who get whole brain radiation after surgical resection of an oligometastatic disease have fewer recurrences in, in the whole brain. Uh, there's also the issue of cyberknife uh, radiation to treat the resection cavity and avoiding whole brain radiation entirely. And some of these are in areas of active investigation to decide what is the best therapy in these situations. 
Uh, one example here, a, a small lesion. We typically treat, we can treat one, two, three lesions. We generally don't go up and treat four or, or, or more. They're usually on the small side. Uh, they can, will often, depending on the individual situation, uh, some may be in surgically inaccessible areas or difficult areas, or there may be other reasons to go with a radiosurgical rather than a surgical approach for these tumors. And this is just uh, one more picture of a, of a lesion uh, that's somewhat more centrally. You can get a very close distribution of radiation dose, as shown by these lines over here. And very little radiation really gets to the, or relatively little radiation goes to, uh, to the whole brain in this situation. And so I will s stop with that and uh, sort of this, the overview.